Ja, yes, uh, hi Astrid. Uh, nå så, så veldig hyggelig å se deg, men jeg, jeg tror vi snakker engelsk. We will speak English. Ja, som du vil. Because, you know, yes, er because bedre. we can use it uh, after. So, first of all, it's really an honor and pleasure for me to do this interview with you. You know, uh, we got to know each other the last year. And of course, uh, there's a lot of people here uh, in the audience um, who have gotten to know you as well. Uh, you have a very impressive career. And I was talking with you the other evening and we were, you were saying to me that actually you have been involved with the World Health Organization since you were quite young. Yep. And you even, you even got to know Hafdan Malik. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I sat with him many times. I know his two children because they took the Master of Public Health at the University of Geneva. But I, I met him, yeah, many times yeah. and we became almost friends, but he was, 90, he was very old then and, you know. Yeah, he, he was very, I followed, I followed him because I, I was very interested in the smallpox eradication program, which I read the whole book, you know. And uh, after that, he was the one that took the initiative for the primary healthcare initiative in Almiati, Almiati. Oh. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and that was a very promising time for the WHO, but it seems that it's changed since then. So anyways, it's very important. What Alfdan made is very important. And he was, it was interesting because we were talking about religion and spirituality and his, his father was a pastor, priest, yes, uh, you know, yeah. pastor. So he was, he, he was yeah, a, he, actually from Den Denmark. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so I think, you know, what you bring to the table in these very uh, special times is very important because the WHO being the, become more and more important. And of course, we know now, we heard that the in the amendments to the international health regulations proposed by the american united states seem to have difficulties to get through you can just tell us the latest on that mm -hmm. before we continue um yeah i i'm very careful what's what's happening because uh, they did not take any decision because if you go to the newsroom and you look at the news um and uh, and the the last speech of tedros gebrayas who the director general re-elected for five years not a doctor well anyway he, there is no real decision that people talk talk but the only thing we know is that they're going to continue the discussion on 16 and 17th of june this means that they have not accepted that it will not pass they did not accept that it will pass but it means that the doors are open for lobby and the lobbying in the United Nations is very strong. So it means that a government will influence another government so that he changes his mind. So I'm a bit, I'm, I'm not that confident yet, not at all. Um, they, they, have, um, they have carved public opinion uh, probably to say we cannot pass it too quickly because people are going to get mad and we, you know, they will see that our plan, but there is a chance 16th, 17th of April, uh, of June, that it will pass and I invite everybody uh, that will listen to register as public hearing at the same time on the WHO website of this treaty uh, where not the US amendment but it is a parallel process that goes in the same time where you can do um, one minute oral intervention by video uh, anybody and you can make uh, abstract 250 words so if you do that to you know oppose and say that we are citizens you have to register it yourself because you don't get any validation of they have received it yeah. and and you you uh, copy your text you take a picture and uh, then we publish it all together yeah. but so, for the so moment I, it's not clear yeah so th that's why i wanted to start with that because that was the latest and but what we're interested and i can really add something Torkel, very yes. important is is that in fact they have said that they will continue the process of uh, the U.S. amendments in June the 16th, 17th, and they will continue the the process of the treaty, the new uh, convention treaty or instrument on first uh, of August. They had already planned that they would do that, and on the side there are working groups, and then it will all end up on in September um, at the UN Assembly in New York, which is the, the father organization of the presidents who say yes, we agree. So yeah. there is a six month process already from the World Health uh, Assembly where we, we have to just, um, you know, massively say we want to get out of this and our government doesn't represent us. They don't. They don't. They, they, they haven't consulted us. And oh. this is a very important point. They have not consulted the public. So the, yeah. that is important. And then there is the election of the US. So I think it is all um, entangled this, you know, yeah. I mean, so it's good so that people 
for those who don't know you, um, you've been heavily involved since uh, some years now because the international health regulations was was voted on veto. Uh, no, it was uh, accepted in, uh, in 2005, right? That well, was there was a first version in 1969 uh, okay. with three disease, cholera, uh, plague, yeah. and uh, yellow fever. But yeah. then it was in after Strascov yeah. one with with our dear Norwegian <laughs> Brundtland, Gro Harlem Brundtland, they started the, the International Health Regulation 2005 yeah. based on Strascov one. Yeah. But so and your but your background is has been uh, I think about 30 years you've been working within the clinical and uh, epidemiological research and you did your PhD yes. in a big cohort on on objective and subjective health, which you comparative yeah. study. And, yes, and, and, so in old people, in old people, man, yes. women, old people. That's why yeah. it's one of the reasons why I reacted. We will talk about. It. Yeah, and and uh, and so, but throughout this, you've been connected to to the WHO, working closely with them and some other NGOs. But what we'd like to hear from you now is, which I'm, I've been thinking about a lot of us who have, you know, suddenly <laughs> become active in this. Is what is it that made you? Um, Come like in what do you want to call some call activists, their whistleblower, so many names of people who start talking outside the narrative. So what was it that made you start publicly to question the narratives and everything? Mm. Yeah, first, uh, you know, in public health, uh, you are you do science, uh, you know, as an epidemiologist, and you know you have done this. You do science for the public and for politics. So um, I have done this my whole life. I have, uh, you know speaking with the media, you know, went on TV, uh, went with the public, went with politics, it's not new. But what is new now, why I reacted very quickly. Um, first, it is, um, there, there are many factors, but the first one, uh, it does not correspond to the international health regulation, the way we had been training people and learning and training people on the international health regulation, implementation and preparedness plan on how an epi curve is managed how uh, you communicate the risk management, how you how you evaluate the risk. Is it chemical, radionuclear? So that was the first thing. It was no, no real scientific data of what is the validation that this virus exists. This exists. And then it was entangled with the fact that they created fear right away with the media. They put pictures, they, they made fear, they put all the masks like cosmonauts, like if it was Ebola. You know, with Ebola, you have to be careful of contamination. And I was in North, Southern Korea for an international conference at that time. And I saw suddenly they they had those temperature tech to, to see if you have temperature. And I thought, okay, this is strange. It's strange. But when I came back to with the airplane to Germany and they were doing the same fear to people in the airport, I thought this is not normal because first in, in uh International health regulation, you don't create fear in anything, in epidemic. You, you, you um, communicate uh, confidence. You say, we are looking, we are scientific. We, we don't know everything right away, like a detective. You, you look at, is it a virus? Is it a chemical? And then you go. And they affirmed very quickly, uh, non-science, they, they affirmed fear. It, it was more a psychological uh, operation they were doing. And, I thought this is really very strange, and and then I thought no, it's when they did the lockdown <laughs> on 15th, 16th of March, the whole world. I thought this is this is a coup d'état. This is wrong because it's not normal. You you know this, uh, it, whether whether it is a contamination, a chemical of a river, a radionuclear, uh, like Chernobyl, a cloud, or or an infectious disease. It it is not real time in the whole world at once. It's not possible. It's not possible. It's so I thought that, that what's going on? I thought this is really strange. And I never wore the mask. You know, I this also I found very quickly an article from Fauci that uh, during um plague the, the most important bacterial infection was from the mask. And I, I was like, well, okay. So all the science was contradicting. And and what I did, I was called um, to make articles for the doctor medical bulletins of the doctors here uh, on the discrimination of old people because they were telling that old people are the most at risk are the ones who have to put the mask and this which is the opposite in in my expertise is is that you have to you know 
not, not make fear, not put a mask that will make bacterial infection, not isolate them, not every, they were doing everything the opposite. And, and then I also wrote an article in Acta Biomedica, you can find it under Zuckerberger, uh, with a medical uh, epidemiologist of Mexico on the international regulation, uncertainties and uh, contradictions. And I, I questioned everything and comparing very easily, you can do that, Strascov-1 management and Strascov-2. And you can see Strascov-1 was managed in, in eight months. It was over. You did, did, did. Brundtland did not even uh, call it a pandemic. It was forbidden to call a pandemic. You know, it was a, it, it's a legal term that has consequences for countries. So, so if you compare eight months, 24 countries touched, 787 deaths, and it's over because coronavirus mutate all the time, you compare with now and you go, no, it, it's it's not possible. <laughs> you see? So I very quickly did that. I also spoke on the radio with the PCR, on the PCR, said we have never seen, we never validated this, even in IHR, it is never there. I was in face of the, the, the responsible person of the lab of the hospital. I, I worked with the hospital, university hospital. This also, I and then what made me really famous <laughs> in, in a good and bad way is the film Hold Up. Hold up, it's a French film and it's an investigation journalist. And he um, he went to uh, interrogate and interview many, many scientists. And that's how I know Alexandra, Henri Encaud and, uh, um, and, um, and Perron. But Perron, I know him since uh, our combat with Lyme disease in WHO. That's another story I have. But, but so this film went by million people of views and it was a huge censorship on all the scientists who participated in this. And then I started to see really censorship. Uh, I got my, my lectures uh, forbidden. Um, they cut off very abruptly my courses at the University of Lausanne. And uh, I got letters from, I keep, I keep them. There are archives, you know, this is becoming history for us. <laughs> but um, the University of, Gen of Geneva wrote me a letter that I'm very dangerous for public health also because I have participated in this film. And I, d I cannot, I don't validate everything everybody says in the film. I was just saying that WHO uh, at the moment is not the World Health Organization, it's the World Disease Organization. <laughs> <laughs> they were only talking about disease. So, so um, I saw very quickly the injustice. It was a deep ethical injustice that the media was, was sustaining. But first, I, I didn't know where it was coming from because I didn't understand that WHO was so um, constructing fear in the population. This, it was a question mark. It was a question mark that the doctors would go for the rhetoric and that there was no debate. And, you know, so it's like a puzzle. It, it's like a, a building, it builds up like this. And then, you know, something is completely wrong. It's, you know, you, yeah. probably so, you, did so, this uh, you know, we have to <laughs> conclude uh, uh, eventually here, but, uh, you know, we could talk for half an hour on this or an hour. It's, I mean, enormous, but I just want to conclude by asking you in the last question. So looking forward, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Or what's your feeling looking forward? And also in relation to your own position and what's happened to yourself, like many others. So how do you feel? What's your, are you, what's your, it is a special mm -hmm. time, so. Yes, um, I see it like uh, we, are in, we are in a dark room and we have some, some lamp lights. We have one pocket lamps. So we know and we can find our way in this in this dark room, but it is becoming brighter and brighter because there are more and more pocket lamps, <laughs> you know, that are used. Uh, we have been censored. We all our colleagues have put us out. Uh, we are attacked as terrorists, you know, but more and more um, what we are saying becomes uh, the credibility of people and they rely on us. So that's how I know you. That's how I know many. And uh, we are building a network that is completely new of ethical people who are committed since the beginning. Some, some are opportunistic and we have to find them on the way. <laughs> but um, I see that this is, is actually very interesting because I always had doubts on how the faculty of medicine is teaching. 
uh, only pharma, I've been 25 years at the faculty of medicine and, and the university. I saw many problems also in WHO. So now, now it's a fantastic chance that we can build a new world. It's not rapid, it's not a Rambo war. It is a very subtle change of consciousness. And um, I'm positive, but sometimes I'm very, um, I get tired. I, I think discouraged sometimes thinking, I better go on my mountains to go skiing. <laughs> <laughs> and to go, but um, it is very essential that we speak. And uh, someone told us that because they are afraid of what we say, that they might not really attack us. We clarify. We are the lights that, with a little pocket lamp, to try to show people. And it's very important in what is going to happen because they try to put um, many other problems. Um, that we will be there to help those who will understand and get the shock, like many doctors. Many doctors are going to have the shock of their life uh, being attacked by their patient for a uh, crime. And I see it happening already. So I think it's it's beautiful to know you, to know and to know Norway and Scandinavia and Tom completely other way. I would never have been able to meet so many people that are great. So I'm positive on that, very. But I, yes. I don't know how we're going to get organized, but it's it's happening. You know, it's like a garden. The flowers are growing and suddenly it's gonna be there. So we have to build a new fac faculties, maybe a new medicine, not called medicine, <laughs> and a new system. It's I don't see any other way. Yeah, so that's great. And thank you very much for for you know joining us. We we have yes, a, yes. over a hundred people sitting in this beautiful sal here in the Nor Norwegian Tai Chi Center. So we really appreciate you. So thank you very much, and good luck to you. And we'll keep yes, in contact yes. uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Torkel, and uh, congratulations for what you're doing and. With all the alternative people will become the the most important groups, I think, in the future. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.